Uh, could you open your Bibles this morning to the book of Hebrews? And you'll see in your notes, we have, we have several verses that we want to read to begin our service because this is the last in our sermon series on the book of Hebrews. Today's the last sermon of it, and we're seeking to summarize it. Uh, we've been in it for a very long time, and we th- thought it would be helpful and appropriate and God-glorifying and soul-edifying to actually review it in one single sermon. Um, and so if you'll open to the texts that you have in your notes, I think these verses help us to capture Christ exalted. And Eric, I love that little chorus you had us sing. We exalt thee, Lord. We exalt thee. And how we pray that this sermon would do the same thing. That we would, we would capture and see Christ exalted because of his worth that we would see Christ exalted because of his work and that we would see Christ exalted in our worshipful response to that, okay? So that's where we're we're gonna go from here. So let's turn to God's word, uh, beginning in Hebrews 1, uh, verses one through four. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. That's a good way to talk about Christ exalted, wouldn't you say? Would you turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4? Let's look now at the, the work of Christ. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise they would not they would have ceased would would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And now stay in that same chapter in verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there's no longer any offering for sin. Oh, I think we should say amen. And then staying in the same chapter, picking up at verse 19 through 25, let's look at a worshipful response. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, would you, would you just give us grace to echo the exaltation of Christ's worth and of Christ's work? Would you give us grace to worshipfully respond to the exalted Christ? Oh, please, Lord. And Lord, as we're hearing and listening today, help us also have hearts to hear the warnings of the book of Hebrews as well as the warmings of the book of Hebrews. We love you and we thank you for being a speaking God through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, during Snowmageddon, I sat down to watch the movie documentary called The End of the Spear. How many of you have seen The End of the Spear? Wow. You know, so here's a suggestion. Great family movie night. Great personal little movie to watch. It tells a story of Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and three other missionaries who were killed in their efforts to bring the gospel to the Wodani people of the rainforests of eastern Ecuador. A grace-filled highlight of the story is that God uses the gospel. He used the gospel that these martyred Christians brought to ultimately, get this, to ultimately save the man who killed the writer of the movie, who killed his dad. The man's name was Minkai, and not only did he save him, this man became like a grandfather. I I can hardly get those words out, because I think how how difficult I have a time of, of forgiving someone who just looked at me funny. How deep the love of Christ. How deep the forgiveness of Jesus for our vile sins. That that forgiveness would not just be cleansing, but transforming to where we could love and forgive even the worst of sinners. Well, we're the worst sinners, we know. But that we could forgive the worst of sins committed against us. So this man became like a grandfather to Nate Saint. And at the end of the movie, Nate Saint brings him from the rainforests to visiting the United States. And one of the biggest takeaways is that Minkai uh, was just boggled with how many choices we have as United States citizens. Just boggled. I mean, he, literally, they show him. He, Minkai is saying, I can't believe the United States is such a wonderful place. You just, you just drive up to someone's house, and someone looks out the window and just gives you food. I mean, it's just, just he, he grows. You go to the grocery store, and there's, there's food from a thousand farms, a thousand gardens, and, and there's as plenty, as much as you could eat, and more. And, And though we take it for granted, we do indeed have tons of choices, don't we? Tons of choices that we get to make every day. This is why there are plenty of consumer digests or consumer reports. This is showing my age because I don't even know if these things exist anymore. But they're, they're, they're websites so that they help you evaluate what product is better. What product is better? I wanna, because don't you? I wanna get what's better. If I'm going to spend my money, I want to get what's better. Well, we know, we want to know what is better in regard to Airbnbs or cars, colleges, home builders, baseball gloves. (laughs) It's our story. Okay, my wife is publicly holding me accountable. Our oven is broken. Okay, babe, that was your one time. <laughs> or ovens, babe. Restaurants, coffee. Even churches get star ratings, which just boggles me. Churches get star ratings? I'm going to go to this church because it's a five... St- well, you know, I guess all that is well and good. But there can be consequences from having so many choices. One of them is FOMO. Do you know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. Mark Dever quotes an author who puts it this way. Trained as consummate consumers, we learn to adopt even religious faith tentatively 
with an eye to new options that might appear around the bend. That's FOMO, isn't it? No wonder we find it less and less credible to find that there might actually be something that is so superior that it's worth dying for. But if there's nothing worth dying for, is there really anything that's worth living for? That's that's a great quote. Devoid of substantive purpose, our lives too easily degenerate into bland avoidance of pain. How many of us, how many of us look for what's better because it's most painless? Maybe it's not the best road to take, but it's the most painless, it's the most convenient, it's the most comfortable. And and we, we just, it's just this unending search for new amusements. In the past, the presentation of choices through mass marketing sought to make a case for why their product or plan or idea is better, and then leave it up to you to make the choice. But we're living in post-Christian United States. We're experiencing a rapid increase of a political narrative that is not only telling us what is better and why, and then leaving the final choice up to us. It's not that anymore, is it? It's telling us what's better and why, and why we have no other option but to adopt it into our worldview and value systems. Take, for instance, when a congresswoman declares that if the court cases do not bring about the judgment that she wants, then there must be greater confrontation in the streets. Jurors are to be guided by the rule of law and render judgments based upon facts, not by fear of repercussions that could include the destruction of their property or even worse, the loss of their lives. Would you, want, would you have wanted to be a juror in the Derek Chauvin trial? Unless you choose what we tell you to choose, you're going to be canceled. Just recently, a decision was made that the gay pride flag was to be allowed to be flown on the same flagpole as the American flag at U.S. embassies around the world. Why? Because it's a declaration that this is the value system of the United States, and we must believe it, lest we be canceled as homophobic or arrested for hate speech because we call it a sin, according to Scripture, And we celebrate God's wisdom and plan in creation to make men biological men and women biological women. And all of this can happen regardless of how much we love and lay down our lives for the precious people who are trapped in these lifestyles. We're pressured to believe and choose that the better pathway for the United States to be great again is to locate sin and systems rather than in the human heart. Thus, to end things like racism or gender bias, we have to tear down every existing system because it's all tainted by this kind of oppression. And, and, and have you noticed that in doing it, you're, you're called to give more and more control to the government to tell us what to believe and why we need to believe it? Even though we would say that the better way is to see the human heart regenerated, there's the way to cure racism. It's through the proclamation of the gospel that regenerates human hearts. The the word of God that sanctifies the human soul so that we, that we, we do far better than any government system or plant sensitivity training because we regard everyone as made in the image of God. And and we want to give everyone the dignity and worth that that, that comes with that. We're pressured to believe that law enforcement is systemically broken and needs either to be eliminated or defunded. All the while, the Bible says that law enforcement is actually a ministry from the Lord. Please, Christian brothers and sisters, please think biblically when you're confronting culture. Law enforcement is a ministry from the Lord that recognizes the reality of human depravity and is called to reward law-keeping and bring justice to lawbreakers according to the rule of law without bias toward race, gender, or economic status. I'm not saying anything in our world is perfect. We should always be reforming. 
But if our culture seeks to eliminate a minister that God has given for our good, it's essentially called God turning our nation over to the godlessness that we are so rabidly pursuing. While we are told that injustices that we have to pay attention to, we're, we're told which injustices we're to pay attention to and what we are to do about it. Did you notice we're also called to turn a blind eye to the greatest injustice going on in our nation every day? It's an injustice against the weakest and most innocent people in our society, that being children in the world. And that doesn't even include the choices we're being told to make about masks and vaccines and the acceptance of critical race theory in our schools and workplaces. And we, we have, we, listen, I, I'm saying all this, you're probably going, how is this related to Hebrews? It has everything to do with Hebrews. Because we have much in common with the Hebrew Christians that the book of Hebrews is written to. Y'all, it's already a challenge to navigate through the various choices we face in living in a fallen world. That's a challenge, isn't it? It's made even harder when we live in a culture that, tell, that, that is telling us what is better and seeking to force our hand in choosing it. This kind of ongoing pressure and even persecution can get wearisome. I mean, can I just ask you a heart-to-heart -heart honest question? How many of you are already weary of what you see happening since the election? How many of you are already, already weary? Just so you know, this is, not a, this is not a political speech. I am not promoting Republicans or Democrats or Libertarians or Independents or anything. I'm, I'm trying to take care of the eternal good of your soul. This kind of ongoing pressure and even persecution, it leads to weariness of soul. It leads to drifting away from devotion to Christ. It, it, it leads to weir growing weary and well-doing. Have you felt that way lately? To letting go of the only real hope that we have in favor of a less painful path? So let's let go of real eternal hope in favor of a temporarily less painful path forward and an acceptance of other values that, that listen, but Pastor Billy, they don't totally eliminate this concept and acknowledgement of Christ. Can't we just be a little more tolerant? We can still have our Jesus, right? And we can still be a little bit more understanding. Man, Billy, you're, you didn't have enough coffee today. Let me tell you this. Wouldn't it be wonderful if God provided us something better? Like an anchor for our souls that would keep us from drifting, that would sustain our faith, that would increase our hope, that would help us endure till the end. Wouldn't it be great if God gave us something or someone better like a living word from heaven that both supplies our greatest need of salvation and a reliable guide that will help us make every other choice in life that we're faced with. Not only for today, but choices that impact our eternal future. Well, that's what the book of Hebrews is all about, Charlie Brown. That's what Hebrews is all about. The book of Hebrews reminds us that Jesus is better supremely better. And so here is my attempt to, to give you a main point that summarizes the book of Hebrews. And it, I want to say it's, it's, it's bordering on moving toward the puritanical titles, except I'm not anywhere close to being a good Puritan. But the main point is trying to get across is this. Precious family, Hebrews calls us to enduring faith and to hold fast to our hope in Jesus because he is the supremely better savior and sustainer of our eternal souls. So let's, let's just enjoy that truth as we take this kind of tiptoe through the sacred pages of the book of Hebrews. Our first point is this. Hebrews warns us to not drift away from Christ because no one is better. Don't drift from Christ because there's no one better. 
There's no one better. So, so come on, put yourselves, let's, let's all put on the sandals of this pastor. I want you to put yourselves in his shoes as he's considering, he's, he's having to care for this church from a distance. There are other local pastors taking care of this church. But it's obvious this precious pastor had a heart for this church. He knew what they were facing in terms of persecution. They were likely in the hotbed of persecution because the, the thought is that this church was likely in Rome itself. He knows that many of them are, are, are growing weary in following Jesus because of the op oppression and persecution that's coming, not only from the Roman government. And remember how Rome saw, saw Christians. Rome saw Christians as the atheists. Do you remember? Do you remember that? No, no. You're the atheists. We're the believers. Well, how are you the believers? Because who, is their, who was their God? Tell me. Caesar. If you don't bow down to Caesar, you're the atheist. And you're hearing fragrances of that in our world today. That, that, that Christ, Christianity is more and more being called the trouble with the United States. Get ready. You're going to hear more. But it wasn't just Rome, was it? It was Judaizers. Because Christians had the belief that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and provides a new and better covenant that offers full and final forgiveness of sins, thus making the old covenant obsolete. So they were experiencing huge pressure from, from probably relatives, family members who had not turned to Jesus for salvation that were still living under the old covenant and the pressures to conform back, to, to, to be even recognized as a family member again. What would you write to this church? Put yourself as this. Maybe, maybe a little bit better. For, for If you're a parent, Jared, what would you write? So let's say this precious young lady to your right, that this precious lady is now in college, and she's struggling. And she's being affected by what she's learning in that university. And you get this sense that there's a diminished passion in her heart. What would you write to her? What about if it's our, so I'm a grandparent. My little Tatey's still learning to walk, so I'm not, I'm right, but, but I'm thinking about what, what would I say to my grandchild who I was concerned was beginning to drift away from the Lord? What would you say? Is there someone in your life like that right now? Probably. You probably have someone you know that is drifting from the Lord, that there was a day you sat shoulder to shoulder worshiping the exalted Christ, and now they don't even darken the, church, the door of a church anymore. What would you say? Well, we get a real sense of God's heart for people, God's love for the local church, God's call for elders to be true, faithfully and biblically true to proclaiming Scripture. What would we say? What would we warn against so that, that people don't ultimately drift so far away that they don't even seem to ever come back again? The problem has a name, and it's in your notes. We, we call it syncretism. And here's an effort at a definition. It's the inappropriate blending of non-Christian religious ideas or practices with the Christian faith. It's the replacement or dilution of the essential truths of the gospel through the incorporation of non-Christian elements. So that was happening with, with, the, with the Hebrew Christians. Hey, okay, listen, you can bring your Jesus, but just you just live day by day practically outwardly. You live according to the law. Listen, you don't have to ignore your Jesus, but just, you know what? See that flagpole that you have in your backyard? Hey, that's great. Fly the American flag. But you can have your Jesus and fly the gay pride flag too. Listen, you can have your Jesus and, 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 and just think social justice is destroying systems rather than proclaiming the saving grace, regenerating power of the gospel to the human heart. You can have your Jesus. Just be more tolerant. Listen, just, listen, don't, we're not saying deny Jesus. We're just saying to let your core values be ruled by something else. 
This is written to people suffering for their faith. So now let's go. Here we go. You see there's a lot of passages. Let's go. Here we go. That how do we know they're suffering for their faith? Because in 10, 32, and 33, it says, But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those who were so treated. For you had compassion on those. Let's keep going. You had compassion on those in prison. Look at, look at how far they went. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, don't throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Listen, you know, a long time ago we said this, please don't have this mentality that thank God on January 1, we're going, thank God 2020 is over. Because we're looking for, what did I just say? Did I just end 2021? Is that, did, did I just, <laughs> sorry about that. Thank God 2020 is over because 2021 is going to be salvific. The Bible says the love of the human heart will grow increasingly cold as the day draws near for the return of the Lord. Precious ones, we look to Jesus, not the calendar, for our hope. So things are likely to get harder. Don't throw away your confidence. You have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God with your last breath, putting saving and sanctifying and sustaining faith in Jesus, you'll receive what was promised. You see, spiritual apathy is seeming to be setting in and in this church, and this pastor is burdened by it, and Alan and Hugh and I are burdened by it. Listen, not so much by the people sitting in this room. We are thrilled you're here. We want to fan the flame of God's grace and the, 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 the gift he's already given you for salvation. We want to fan that flame into a full-blown fire that's shining the light of Christ everywhere you go. But I'm burdened, I'm burdened for, the, so, for the, the nominal Christians in Midland, Texas. There's a spiritual apathy that, that is setting in because they were looking for a better life that would not put them in a position of being pressured or persecuted. And, and, and so they were in danger of drifting. Here we go, Hebrews 2, 1 through 3. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard as these pressures are happening, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So you see the, the burden of this author's heart. Drifting is dangerous because it's imperceptible at any given moment. See, I don't even think that I could, I mean, I don't know that I could even have a conversation with you today. And that you could have one with me to be able to say, is there any way you're drifting from the Lord right now? One, we think highly of ourselves, don't we? I think we, t we tend to think more highly of ourselves than, than we ought. Drifting at the moment doesn't feel like drifting. Unless you're constantly hearing the proclamation of the inerrant, sufficient, Christ-exalting word of God. That's how we know we're drifting. Unless you're in regular, accountable, grace-motivated fellowship with other people. That's how we know we're drifting. But taking Sundays off may be a sign of drifting, wouldn't you say? Not if you're sick. Your boss may be a sent you to who knows where. But it's dangerous because it's imperceptible when it's happening. And it doesn't look like drifting until it's taken you farther than you wanted to go. And it's keeping you there longer than you wanted to stay. And it's making you pay more than you wanted to pay, right? That's, when, that's, when, that's, that's typically when we pay attention to it. Drifting will always be related to a hardening of the heart. A hardening of the heart to God. A hardening of the heart to his word. A hardening of the heart to his church and mission. 
Let's keep reading. So take care, brothers, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an unbelievable, an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, how do we know? If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as they did in the rebellion. Are you, would you say you have a heart to hear God's word this morning? Or are you already somehow kind of getting bugged? This isn't very entertaining. Drifting and hardness of heart will result in walking by sight and not by faith and could ultimately reveal that the faith that you thought was saving wasn't ever saving at all. Hebrews 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, while the promise of entering into his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as it came to them, but the message they heard, i.e. the Old Testament believers, or the Old Testament people who were rejecting Messiah, the message they heard did not benefit them because they, it was not united by faith in those who listened. This brought about dull hearing. Let's keep going. In Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. About this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature, who, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Drifting and hardness can be seen in a decline in your interest in the local church. Thank you for not being that way. For all the people who are newer to our church, you are, it's a, such a joy to worship with you because we're seeing even in our newer attenders or our new members, a love and a recognition of our need to gather as the local church. Listen. One of our newer attenders told me the other day, he has family in Austin. He was going back and forth a lot to take care of family needs. He had a... a um, Sibling moving back to Austin, he had a home there. He wanted to get it fixed up for them. But what he was realizing is, you know, I'm doing a lot of good things, and I'm not in church. And I think it was Easter Sunday. And I had seen on social media that, that he was doing something with his playing guitar with somebody that I know who's in Austin. So I didn't think he'd be here. And I walked in Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, and I saw him. And I said, what are you doing here? <laughs> Probably not the best way to start a conversation. <laughs> a loving, what a loving pastor, huh? What are, what are you doing here? Yeah, he was gracious with my lousy sentence. He said, I've just made a resolution to, to my heart to the Lord that I, I want to at least be in this local church three out of four Sundays a month and maybe once a month go see my family. Drifting and hardness can be seen in a lack of love for the local church. Hear what the word says. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who, who is promised is faithful and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. The implication is, as is the growing habit of some. And remember, this is not impugning you or your character. This is recognizing pressure and oppression going on in this fallen world around you and, and recognizing the impact that pressure and oppression... Listen, pressure and oppression affect the, the heart that's white hot for Christ. What about the heart that's already adrift? 
Oh, don't neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some. And actually, actually, as we, as we sense the day of the Lord's return, we ought to be getting together more. What about growing weary and losing heart? He says this in Hebrews 12. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Do you know, parents, please know this. We, we try as much as we can to give a theology, a biblical theology of suffering to our younger generation. Because one of the reasons, and I'll, I, I, you, listen, I wish my, I wish I could get my sons here, and you could just talk with them, and they will tell you that, that most of the time, the, the, the college students they see leaving their faith, abandoning the church, it's because they got upset with God because of suffering. They blamed God because of suffering. They had no understanding of Christ suffering in our place. And then because of his suffering in our place, he calls us to share in his sufferings as we take the gospel to this world. But if, if but, I mean, you see what happens, this, you, this is love, you letting me go through this? Well, look at the cross. Precious ones, this is love, letting Jesus go through this. There needs to be this understanding of how God's discipline is at work, even in your hardships and your trials. And when the word is not what your ears and eyes are fixed upon, it creates a vacuum and it opens your eyes and ears to believe something or someone else. Hebrews 13, 9 in your notes. So don't be led, led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Don't listen. So I'm not, talk, I'm not worried about any of you going back to Judaism. I'm not, I'm not worried about you going back to the old covenant. I am worried about the role critical race theory plays. I am worried about the whole issue of gender and gender confusion and gender fluidity. I am worried about that. Precious ones, parents, listen, we, our kids, it's everywhere. I, listen, I, I shut down my TV as much as I can, but then my, my son gets a job employment questionnaire, and they ask for his sex, and it says male, female, non-binary, or prefer not, to an, pre, prefer not to answer. You can't buy a plane ticket without that, without these questions being asked. We, we want to fix our eyes on Jesus, don't we? So that we're not led astray by diverse teachings. Oh, how these people needed enduring faith. Oh, how we need enduring faith. So what does this faithful pastor do? I mean, you know, listen, we think, oh, it's, we got all this social media and all this. Well, we do. Techno, techno, there's nothing like the technology of today for prior church history. But don't think that pastors in pastoring in Rome weren't affected by, or tempted by saying, you know, maybe if we'll just incorporate a little more of the Greco-Roman theater into our... You don't think people attended Greco-Roman theater? That they were looking for amusement as much as we're looking for amusement? Maybe if we build in a few skits and a few of these dramatic presentations, maybe if we become better at eloquent speech making, maybe then we can kind of sneak the gospel in when they're not looking. Whatever we draw people with, we will draw people to. I don't remember who said that. Maybe R.C. Sproul. But it, it, we, listen, we want people to come to this service Sunday mornings, because they're going to hear of the exalted Jesus. Because as we lift him up, he will do the drawing, won't he? Oh, my goodness, how we need enduring faith. So what does this pastor do? Does he, does he turn to skits and light and smoke? And <laughs> no. no, you know what he does? He preaches a sermon. Oh, it kind of lets you down. <laughs> he preaches a sermon. Yeah, remember last week? That's what Hebrews 13 said. 
I've wrote, written to you this brief exhortation. You know what he did? The only place that the power of God, that, that God has designed for the power to change a hard human heart is in the preaching of the gospel and, and attended to by the presence and person of the Holy Spirit. Why would we use anything else? He preaches a sermon to exalt the living Christ. The word, both privately read and publicly preached, is given by God to help you hold fast until the end. In the midst of governmental injustice and religious hypocrisy and the pressure to fit in and go with the flow and not cause controversy, and God saw fit to have his word preached. That's how we confront it. We preach it and we believe it and we tell it to others. Amen? That's how. Listen, the reason I get so impassioned about this is because, listen, I, I believe that the scriptures would hold, I, I think I'm, I'm standing on scriptural principle and precedent by saying this. Every sermon is a salvation sermon. Not, now, for somebody today, it might be you're, you're being regenerated. You're being born again. Your, your, your entrance into salvation through repentance and faith in Jesus. But did you know that we are not, you know this little ditty, we are saved. We have been saved. Say it with me. We are being saved and we will be saved. So that's why every sermon is a salvation sermon. Every sermon is to sustain your faith. That's why we're here. What, why do you go to church if your soul is not being lifted up to have a fresh vision of Christ and him crucified? What are you doing with your Sundays? Well, I know what you're doing. You're doing awesome things. <laughs> so please, I mean, hear my heart. Because I think you're needing to echo these truths in your family, in your, in your sphere, in the people that you have uh, influence in. The greatest need in the human heart is to have the word of God expounded and applied in the power of the spirit. Because the word exalts Jesus. It exalts his eternal priesthood. So here you're going to hear Hebrews. It, it, it exalts his once for all sacrifice for sins. It exalts him as the risen and living shepherd watching out for your eternal soul. It exalts the kingship of Christ. The lordship of Christ. And the reign of Christ. Don't you need that reminder today? This writer fights all of this with a long... Do you know this is the, the... Except for Romans, this is the most theologically rich book in New, the New Testament. And so, I mean, you think about... Listen, Alan and I, I mean, we, get, we get crazy mail. We get crazy Christian mail about how to grow churches. I, I don't think I've ever gotten a piece of mail that says... Preach the most theologically dense book of the Bible. <laughs> and yet, isn't that what God calls us to do? Because it's not just information, is it? It's our hope of transformation as well. So let's, let's look at these next points. So what does he do? He exalts Jesus. Second point is he exalts the worth of Christ as supremely better. He, Hebrews acknowledges that there are many religious leaders that they could follow. Some of them were even noble and good. These were leaders like Abraham and Moses and Aaron and David. And that by following them more than you follow Christ, listen, those are good leaders. Why don't you follow them? Maybe you'll have less pain and problems. But Jesus is better, isn't he? Because Jesus is the son of God. I'm going to read again what we started with this morning. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. It's in your notes. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed as the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So listen, listen. If you've been weighed down by the news the Democrats don't uphold the world by the word of their power. The Republicans don't uphold the world by the word of their power. 
<laughs> and so the cowboys don't uphold the world <laughs> by the word of their power. And what did this amazing God, the Son, do? After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he's inherited is more excellent than theirs. There were other good leaders, but they all died. <laughs> every high priest died. Every other priest died. But Jesus is the Son, the eternal Son of God, and therefore is an eternal priest of God. Look at Hebrews 7, 23 through 25. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But I'd love to serve another year, but <laughs> croak, right? I mean, they just die. But, he, but Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. And so consequently, he is able to save, I love this phrase, to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is right now praying for you if you are a, a believer in him and his salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He is praying for you. You know what he's praying? He's praying, oh Lord, as they're hearing the word, may their faith be strengthened in the word. And God, in accordance with my high priestly prayer, uh, may their faith endure. May their faith not fail. And Jesus gets his prayers answered. Why did these priests die? Why, is Jesus, uh, why didn't Jesus die? Because every other priest had sinned. Jesus is without sin. So look at Hebrews 7, 26 through 28. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those other high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all oh, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, oh, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Let's keep going. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's how I'm going to close you in just a minute. Close you. That's how I'm going to <laughs> Okay, nurse, we'll close up now. I mean, what are, you saying? What are we doing? Surgery? Maybe the word is doing surgery. I, I hope that is. I hope that is. Well, Hebrews doesn't ex just only exalt the worth of Christ. It exalts his work, not ours. It exalts his work as the only work that we can trust in for salvation. His work is supremely better. The other priests offered sacrifices regularly of bulls and goats. Why did they need to be repeated? Because there were imperfect priests offering imperfect sacrifices. How about Hebrews 10, 1 through 4? Since, since the law is but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having been, been once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, in the old covenant sacrifices, there remained this reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Do you ever live there? This morning when you came in, were you more aware, were you more reminded of your sins or of grace? Well, I hope at this point in the sermon, you're more aware of grace. I hope you're more aware of grace. But Jesus, he offers the perfect sacrifice. He offered himself. Hebrews 7, 26 and 27, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. And then, because he rose again, 
Hebrews 10, 11 through 14, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It's called, it is finished. Waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his, seat, for his feet. For by a single offering, he's perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And listen, the news just gets better. Because this Jesus also inaugurated a new covenant, which means a new heart. And that's what Hebrews 10, 16 says. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Don't we need the exalted work of Jesus, too. Hebrews gives us grace to have faith that endures until the end. Remember Hebrews 11? We went through that. We took, I don't know, four or five Sundays to go through Hebrews 11. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. That's why he's preaching the exalted Christ. Christ is the supremely better object of our faith. We, we preach Christ because of his worth. We preach Christ because of his work. And you know why? Because the more certain you are of his worth and his work, the more you're going to experience enduring faith. That's what, we're, that's what we believe we're called as pastors to facilitate in the preaching of God's word. The more certain you are of his worth and his work, the more you're going to continue to lay hold of the hope that's set before you in Christ alone. Eric, would you come? And so this is why this passage ends, or this sermon ends with Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Because listen to how saving faith by grace alone gives us enduring faith that comes by grace alone too. And this is, this is the worshipful response to the worth of Christ. Verse 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. So, so everybody, here's application right here. In full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water, let us, it's a group project here, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near.